Hello there, geographers, and welcome back to the Mr. Sin channel. Today's a big day, geographers. We're going to be going into Unit 7, Topic 5, Theories of Development. In this video, we're going to be looking at Rousseau's stages of development. We'll look at Wallerstein's world system theory, the dependency theory, and much more. So smash that subscribe button, hit that like button, and let's get ready to look at, well, theories of development. Now, since the Industrial Revolution, we've seen the standard of living for people go up around the world. However, we've also seen unequal economic development when we're looking at the globe. And this can be clearly illustrated when looking at Rousseau's stages of economic growth and also Wallerstein's world system theory. When looking at Rousseau's stages of economic growth, we can see that all countries have the ability to modernize and develop. The first stage is traditional society. Here, the primary focus is on subsistence agriculture. Productivity is low, and the majority of the workforce is in the primary sector. And just in case you need a reminder of the primary, secondary, tertiary sector, make sure you go back and watch my video on Unit 7, Topic 2. That'll cover all the information you need to know for this video. The second stage is the preconditions for takeoff. Society starts to see a demand from outside states for raw materials. As more states seek raw resources, we start to see changes, both politically and economically, for society. This creates new opportunities that start to shift the economy from primarily providing jobs in the primary sector to now offering jobs in the secondary sector. From there, we see society moves into the takeoff stage where urbanization starts to occur. Here we also start to see more jobs and opportunities become available to citizens in the secondary sector. New technology has been introduced into society which has allowed for more production to occur. Unfortunately this new production and the exportation of raw resources and goods onto the world market leads to foreign states to take advantage of a country and we start to see the exploitation of natural resources and also domestic labor. The next stage is the drive to maturity stage. Here we start to see more specialization occur and global trade happen. This helps create a diversified economy for a state, which creates new opportunities for citizens in the tertiary sector. During this stage, we can still see the influence of outside states on the economy, but society now is more independent and is less reliant on exporting their natural resources. Lastly, we have the age of mass consumption. Society now produces products that are no longer meeting the basic needs. We now have products that are being produced that meet the wants and needs of citizens. We also see that the majority of jobs now have started to move into the tertiary sector of the economy, and society is now fairly independent of outside states. Now, if we move from Rousseau's model and look at Wallerstein's world system theory, we can see some similar themes. Wallerstein believed that all countries in the world were interdependent on one another. This means that they relied on each other, they interact and impacted each other in more ways than we realize. Wallerstein's world system theory puts countries into three different categories. We can see that we have core countries, semi periphery countries, and also periphery countries. Core countries are the most developed with the most advanced economies, with the periphery countries being the least developed and the weakest economies. Wallerstein noticed that core countries purchase consumption goods and raw resources from the semi periphery and periphery countries. This is because these countries use cheap labor and also have cheaper raw resources to be able to produce products. This allows core countries to provide more of a variety of goods for their residents and also a cheaper price. Periphery countries will often become dependent on a few core countries. These core countries will use this dependency to their advantage to continue to exploit the periphery country's cheap labor and raw resources. This makes it more difficult for periphery countries to advance since their resources and production are being exported to core countries instead of benefiting their own economy. This imbalance between the core countries and periphery countries is known as the dependency theory. We can see that core countries disproportionately benefit from the trade. The periphery countries' economies become directly connected to business with the core country, and they can't afford to lose that business. And we can see that this relationship is a one-way street. Core countries, if things go south, can always find another periphery country to produce goods and resources for them at a cheap rate. However, the periphery country's economy now is directly tied to the business with that core country, and it would be very difficult for them to quickly recover if they lose that business. So we can see that core countries have a lot of power in these relationships. Relationships. Another concept that we need to understand when we're looking at global trade is a commodity dependence. This happens when a country's exports are made up of over 60% commodities. This would be raw resources or agricultural products. Countries that are commodity dependent risk their economy becoming connected to the day-to-day -day changes in price of the commodities in which they sell. If the commodity they sell sees a drastic decrease in the price, it could devastate the entire economy. 
We can see this happen with countries like Venezuela, where oil comprises over 95% of their exports, making their economy extremely vulnerable to changes in the price of crude oil. By understanding Wallerstein's world system theory and Rousseau's stages of economic growth, we can really see just how connected the world is. This trade has changed how we produce products and where we produce them. We can see also that we have unequal economic development, and it disproportionately favors core countries over the semi-periphery and also periphery countries. And it'll be interesting to see in the future of what happens to these relationships as we continue to see more economic develop happen in the periphery and also semi-periphery countries. But before we get into the future, we have to talk about the present and we have to review what we just learned. So take a minute or two, review the questions on the screen right now, check your answers in the comments below. And while you're down there checking your answers, make sure to hit that subscribe button. It's a great way to support the channel, it's free, and you can always change your mind later. Plus, it'll make sure you don't miss out on any future topic review videos. Also, if you need more help with human geography, consider checking out either the Mr. Sin Discord channel or also check out my ultimate review packet. Both resources are a great place to study and to learn human geography. It'll help you get an A in your class and also a five on the national exam. You can find links to both of those resources in the description of this video. Thanks again for watching this, geographers. I'm Mr. Sin, and until next time, I'll see you guys online.